Here's the lowdown on nuclear power. It's extraordinarily expensive. It's too slow, it's too expensive. Nuclear will drive up the cost of electricity for millions of families Where, and businesses you across on? the country. Renewable energy is the cheapest form of energy, Mr yeah. Speaker. The evidence is in. One of the biggest objections to Australia getting nuclear power is that it costs too much. But is nuclear power expensive compared to renewables? While solar panels and wind turbines themselves are relatively cheap, weather-dependent renewables require vast amounts of expensive batteries, pumped hydro storage and transmission to ensure reliability. While nuclear costs a lot more to build, it provides reliable electricity for many decades, greatly reducing the need for expensive firming infrastructure. So where did the idea that nuclear is double the cost of renewables come from? The CSIRO's annual Gen Cost Report, which compares the cost of different energy sources in Australia. You can see how Gen Cost results have the lower bound of nuclear being more expensive than the upper bound of renewables. But I'll show you how correcting three unrealistic assumptions in the Gen Cost model makes nuclear cost competitive with renewables. The first is lifespan. Gen Cost assumes an economic life of 30 years for nuclear plants. This is despite new nuclear reactors around the world being built to last 60 to 100 years. The second is utilisation rate. GenCost assumes nuclear plants in Australia would operate at as low as 53% capacity, when nuclear plants in the US average 93%, and plants worldwide average over 80%. Like the US, we would want to get as much energy as possible out of our nuclear plants to keep costs down, rather than forcing plants to ramp down to make room for wind and solar. Finally, fuel cost. GenCost locks in uranium prices at the very high levels seen from the Ukraine war, despite projections that prices will fall over time. Thankfully, uranium is such a cheap fuel that this does not impact the end results as much as the first two factors. Fixing these three unrealistic assumptions about the economic life, utilization rate, and fuel cost of nuclear reactors puts the actual cost estimate smack back in the range of firm renewables. But looking more deeply into the analysis reveals that the CSIRO may not have included all the costs of the renewables grid Australia is building. Offshore wind, which the Victorian government has committed to, despite it being a lot more expensive than onshore wind, is not included in the CSIRO's renewable cost estimates. Another problem is the Gen Cost model works out the cost of storage and transmission by selecting the year requiring the most firming infrastructure from only nine different weather years. But the electricity system we build now needs to be resilient to decades of varying weather patterns. This means that the system modelled by the CSIRO is unlikely to be reliable and therefore underestimates the true cost of storage and transmission needed to firm renewables. If all the costs were included, a grid relying on nuclear would likely come out much cheaper than a grid dominated by renewables. So why do we keep hearing the message that adding more renewables is the cheapest way for Australia to reduce emissions? Reliable renewables are the cheapest form of power and we've got them in abundance. This comes straight from the Australian Energy Market Operator. AEMO is responsible for creating the master plan for Australia's energy grid every two years, the Integrated System Plan. The ISP claims renewable energy, connected by transmission and distribution, firmed with storage and backed up by gas power generation, is the cheapest way to transition to a net zero economy. But the ISP does not test a renewables option against a nuclear option. It doesn't even find the cheapest way to build a renewables dominated grid, because it assumes that government targets must be met no matter how unrealistic or expensive. The plan prescribes, rather than predicts, 82% renewables adoption by 2030. Despite this being the federal government's current target, many energy experts agree this is highly unlikely to be achieved. AEMO's statement about a least cost system have made it easy to fall into the trap of relying on circular logic. AEMO is really saying, given the government's policy is to eliminate carbon using lots of renewables, lots of renewables must be the cheapest option consistent with government policy. In other words, they haven't actually compared it to another alternative that permits different fuel sources. Similar to the GenCost model, AEMO's model does not guarantee reliability across a plausible range of weather conditions. Even worse, AEMO assumes households will do the heavy lifting by buying electric vehicles en masse to feed electricity back into the grid and investing hundreds of billions of dollars in home batteries and rooftop solar systems. 
the costs and incentives necessary to make this happen are not included in the model. But haven't nuclear power plants faced major delays and cost blowouts in recent years? Some have, and some haven't. Many plants in China and Korea have been built on time and on budget. Even in the UAE, a country building its first nuclear power plant was successfully able to deliver four reactors close to the scheduled time and budget. But in the West, things have been different. Two new reactors added to the Vogtel plant in the US state of Georgia arrived seven years late and doubled the original cost. The UK's Hinkley Point C has experienced similar cost overruns and is expected to arrive more than a decade behind schedule. While COVID had a major impact on the supply chains and workforces for these projects, there were other factors that contributed to delays and cost blowouts, including changes in plant design, complex financing arrangements, bankruptcy and regulatory challenges. So how can Australia ensure any nuclear plants we build avoid the same mistakes? Firstly, Australia should select a design that has worked well overseas. The first reactor of its kind tends to be very expensive. So choosing a proven design that has already been built many times will help to reduce costly delays. Secondly, Australia should build larger nuclear power plants at a limited number of sites so that economies of scale can keep costs down. On or near existing coal sites, water and transmission assets can be reused. Fixed overheads at each site can be spread across a greater amount of electricity generation, making electricity from the nuclear plants cheaper overall. Lastly, Australia should ensure the interests of the entities responsible for building, operating and owning nuclear plants are aligned. This ensures the builder will want to finish the nuclear plants as quickly as possible while still ensuring safe, efficient and reliable operations in the longer run. With careful and efficient planning and regulation, Australia can avoid the cost blowouts and delays experienced by other Western countries that have resumed building nuclear reactors in recent years. And while major infrastructure projects in Australia generally have higher costs than other countries, this is true whether we're building nuclear plants, pumped hydro storage or transmission. A great example is Snowy 2.0 the largest pumped hydro project in Australia, which has faced massive cost blowouts from the initial 2 billion estimate in 2017 to 12 billion in 2023. This was caused by delays in construction arise from drilling equipment getting stuck, as well as supply chain disruptions and inflation in labor and material costs. Likewise for transmission, the Humlink project connecting Snowy 2.0 to the rest of New South Wales was originally slated as 1.3 billion before eventually being proved for 4.6 billion. To decide whether we keep going full tilt on renewables or allow nuclear to enter the mix, we need to compare energy sources on the fundamentals. To reduce emissions while keeping the lights on at an affordable price, we need nuclear. If you'd like to find out more about nuclear energy's cost, safety, environmental effects and other important questions, Head to energy.cis.org.au to read our frequently asked questions or visit the Centre for Independent Studies website to read the energy team's papers. I'm Aidan Morrison for John Anderson Media.